Hello and welcome to another video in our Day of the Life series. We're going to travel back in time and look at the life of one medieval monk who it turned out became a magician, an outlaw, a mercenary, a pirate, and even had a brief stint as admiral of the French fleet. Now, monks aside, before we get into this video, I'd like to talk a little bit about viruses. Viruses ran amok in the medieval period, and the modern day has its own viruses. Ones that will infiltrate your computer rather than your gut, and can destroy or even steal your personal data. So don't open that suspicious looking email attachment, it might contain the plague. Don't download software from an untrusted website, almost certainly riddled with dysentery. Do you see where this is going? We've been using the NordVPN threat protection feature to keep ourselves protected against any potential viruses. It's more effective than praying, bloodletting, or even pilgrimages. NordVPN have been helping keep all of our devices healthy and secure, so we're happy to say that we've got an exclusive deal with NordVPN, who are providing you with four months for free on a two-year plan by using the link in the description. Things would have been strict back in the day, even googling simple things like how to overturn the Lord of the Manor may well have landed you in hot water. Literally. We've been using NordVPN to hide our searches, as well as keeping us safe while scrolling online. Now you can plot your revenge on the landed gentry in safety too, just by signing up to NordVPN in the link below. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, so what are you waiting for? Protect yourself from any miasma with NordVPN today, for less than one goat a month which is equivalent to a Starbucks venti latte. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Sorcerer. Eustace was born around 1170 near to Boulogne in northern France. His father was a minor noble named Bourdouin Busquet and a lord of the county of Boulogne. Eustace is thought to have followed the usual course of military training for knighthood as expected of the son of a noble. At some point though, he travelled to Toledo in Spain, at that time Spain was famous for its magic schools, and Toledo in particular had the oldest and most famous school, not including Hogwarts, for the study of occult sciences. Once there, Eustace learned necromancy and the dark arts. After his travels and dabbles, Eustace made a bizarre career change and joined the clergy. monk. Life was strict in a monastery. Yes, there was the surety of knowing that there would always be a roof over one's head and a steady supply of food, but there were sacrifices to be made for these privileges. Such as living simply with hardly any possessions, attending prayers and services at all times of the day and night, maybe taking a vow of silence or exposing oneself to all sorts of nasty diseases when tending to the sick. For a Benedictine monk, the day began early before daybreak. Somewhere between 4 and 7am, depending upon the monastical order in question and the time of year. The routine being dictated by the light available. After waking and fetching a jug of water for washing and shaving, a monk would make their way through the cloister to church for their first service of the day. Around 6.30am, breakfast would be served and there was to be strictly no talking during the meal. This was usually followed by reading and prayers. At 9am there would be a second service of high mass before work began and the monks would either farm, produce manuscripts, or look after their patients. At noon another church service was followed by the main meal of vegetables and fish as meat was saved for those who were ill. Then, you guessed it, further reading or prayers. This mix of work and praying would alternate all day until by 9pm the monks would be having their sixth church service followed by some well-earned sleep only to be woken again at midnight for another service known as matins. By 1am they were back in bed for just a few hours before getting up at dawn and doing it all over again. Eat, sleep, pray, repeat. A monk's clothing was meant to cover as much skin as possible. Linen underclothes were worn beneath a woolen tunic that was tied at the waist with a belt. Over this was a monastic cowl with a hood. Designed for practicality rather than fashion, the clothing was made from the cheapest and thereby coarsest of materials. Their heads were tonsured, this meant that they were shaved on top, leaving a band of hair just above their ears. Possessions were kept to a minimum, maybe just a comb and a penknife was allowed. It was hardly a glamorous existence.
farter, not faster. It was to this way of life that Eustace decided to turn when he arrived at Sema Abbey in Calais. It seems a strange choice for a man who was dabbling in the black arts to dedicate himself to God, but maybe he had seen the light and wanted to renounce his wicked ways. Or maybe it was because he was a younger son and unlikely to inherit his father's lands. Being part of the clergy was a respected career choice and there was a chance of real power if a man could rise to the top. But it turned out that rules and regulations were not Eustace's thing at all. It seemed that living simply, praying, reading the Bible, and generally being good was a little too hard for Eustace to take, and he soon began performing many devilish acts. His lists of transgressions included gambling, stealing, and encouraging his fellow monks to eat when they were supposed to be fasting. He also encouraged them to be disobedient, swear during prayers, and fart in the cloister. His abbot described him as a demon. Not surprisingly, Eustace left his Benedictine orders, more than likely before he was thrown out, and entered the employ of the powerful Renaud de de Martin, the Count of Boulogne. Outlaw There in 1203, his intelligence and military ability were acknowledged when Eustace became an administrative officer and bailiff. Until, true to form, he ended up in trouble and was accused of financial misconduct. Eustace fled and the Count seized all of his property and lands. Eustace declared himself an outlaw, hiding out in the forests of Boulogne. From there, he took revenge by burning down two of the Count's newly built mills. A romantic biography was written about the foul-mouthed Eustace sometime in the 13th century by an unknown poet from Picardy. The account tells of the outlaw's escapades at this time. How he would slip in and out of the forest to perform raids and humiliate the Count time and time again. At one time, he dressed himself as a one-legged beggar by tying up one of his legs, the ruse worked, and the Count gave Eustace some charity money. He promptly jumped onto the Count's horse and rode away, with his crutch hanging down. Then, when disguised as a woman, he tricked one of the Count's knights by offering sexual favours and enticing him by promising to teach him, quote, how to use his bum. The knight was enthralled with this suggestion, but as he came up behind his new paramour, Eustace just lifted his leg and farted. Inevitably, the encounter ended with Eustace stealing the knight's horse, and leaves us with the feeling that Eustace had a thing about breaking wind. These revengeful attacks on the Count and his men from the forest are thought to have been an inspiration for the legend of Robin Hood. But there was a nastier and more ruthless side to Eustace, which can be seen when he caught five of the Count's men-at-arms. He cut the feet off four of them and let the fifth man go back to the Count to tell him what he had seen. Worse still, when a young boy was caught spying, Eustace forced him to hang himself for the offence. Then, not just to really get under the skin of the Count of Boulogne, but also just to wind up the French King Philippe II sometime between 1204 and 1205, Eustace began working for King John of England. Pirate King John was fighting to keep his lands in Normandy, and never one to miss a lucrative business opportunity, Eustace allied himself with the English. John saw the potential in the former monk and gave him the command of 30 galleys. Eustace set up a pirate base on the Channel Islands with his brothers from where he launched attacks on the French coast. Using his network of mercenaries, he also plundered ships from every nation that sailed into the waters of the English Channel and the Straits of Dover. Making himself indispensable to King John, he was rewarded with a grand palace in London and lands in Norfolk. His daughter was accepted among the English nobility, and Eustace was so well regarded that John even pardoned him when, unable to keep his habit of wreaking havoc in check, he raided some villages along the English coast as well. But in 1212, something happened which caused Eustace to switch his loyalty to the King of France. There are stories involving his old friend, the Count of Boulogne, who it is said allied himself with the English and poisoned King John's mind against the pirate. Another tale states that Eustace owned King John 20 marks, so John took Eustace's wife and daughter hostage, maiming and killing his daughter, and seizing his lands when the tactic didn't work. Whichever story is true, Eustace left England to work for King Philippe II of France, and it is thought he took five galleys with him. The French, aware of his growing stronghold, sent their southern fleet to attack the pirates in the Channel Islands. Many were captured, including some of Eustace's own brothers. Admiral King Philippe had taken Normandy from the English in 1204, and by 1215, civil war was raging in England, with many of the barons rebelling against King John. 
Philippe of France was more than happy to have Eustace on his side. After all, the man had a great knowledge of the English Channel and knew about the capabilities of the English military. Making Eustace his admiral in the Channel, Philippe described him as being brave and bold with guile and cunning. Philippe's son, Prince Louis, was invited to England by the rebel barons to be the next king. The huge invasion force included 680 ships with 1,200 knights, infantrymen, horses, and supplies. Eustace was in charge of the French fleet at Dam, making him responsible for two of the biggest naval forces that Northern Europe had seen since the Third Crusade. During the year and a half long siege, Louis took control of up to half of England. But in October of 1216, King John died. The crowning of his son, the nine-year-old Henry III, caused a surge of patriotism in England, and the French began to lose ground. With Prince Louis trapped in the sink port of Rye, a French fleet was called on to shift the blockade. In a daring raid, only one ship was able to get through and rescue the prince, the one captained by Admiral Eustace. Legend But it was the Battle of Sandwich that proved to be Eustace's nemesis. Louis quickly returned to England to fight on, but was defeated at Lincoln Castle in 1217. Once again, Eustace went to his aid, taking with him a fleet of around 80 ships that were said to be large enough to conquer the realm. The English armada of just 40 ships met the French off the coast of Sandwich in Kent. It should have been an easy victory for the French, but the English prevented them from boarding their ships by covering the decks in powdered lime. As the wind picked up, the lime blew into the faces of the French, blinding them. As Eustace's ship was overrun, all of the French soldiers and sailors on board were slaughtered, whilst the knights were kept alive for ransom. It's estimated that altogether that day, some 4,000 Frenchmen were killed, and even more were drowned, jumping over the sides of their ships. Knowing he was hated for his double dealing, Eustace hid in the ship's bilge, but was dragged from his hiding place. He offered a huge amount of money as a ransom, some say as much as 10,000 marks, but all he was given was the choice of execution site, either the side of the trebuchet or the ship's rail. It's unknown which one he chose, but he was beheaded there on the deck. His head was taken to Canterbury, where it was stuck on a pike and paraded throughout Europe to prove that the notorious Eustace was really dead. Just the mention of his name was enough to strike fear into any seaman as Eustace became, arguably, one of the greatest naval commanders of the medieval period. Eustace the Black Monk murdered and double-crossed his way into the history books as one of the most unholy men that ever lived. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe if you're enjoying these videos as we do release a new one every Friday. Hope you all have a great week. Cheers!